yeah, take you to hard. the wolves. Uh, I'm out. <laughs> what do you got? I don't know. We've already heard a bunch of stuff. Uh, just, <laughs> no one guy can talk, can he? So what happens in uh, episode 13 and how does it end? <laughs> The dog lives. Oh, good, good. <laughs> totally putting that on my spoiler list right now. Dog. So, you know, you, you, you realize, okay, we have to it, at least finish this or come up with a satisfying conclusion in 13 episodes with the hopes that you can get more, sell it somewhere else. But, so, how did you go about doing this? I mean, just... You know, there's certain story points we've always wanted to hit where we know where the show was going to end. And some of those things will have to be pulled up because we don't know, you know, obviously after 13 episodes what's going to happen. But you know, just know this, like every season finale that we write could be a series finale. It was like, sure. it was after the last one, my brother called me and goes, why don't you just end it there? That was great. And I was like... Kind of cool, but we actually had more story to tell, yeah. and uh, we're very excited. I, I think I think this could be our best season yet. We're just we're kind of unfettered to a degree by the 22, 23 episode thing, right? And you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, we have so much story. We have so like we started mapping out those serialized elements, and we realized how much we had. It was it just became a question of like, how are we going to condense this all into all these episodes? The, number, the numbers of the week, you know, it's, it's always been sort of the engine of the show to a degree. And right. It's not something we wanted to get away from, but if we have to, certain episodes, you know, this year, we got to do it because uh, there's a larger story here that we've always wanted to tell. Uh, fortunately for us, current events seem to just keep clicking right in for us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. easily. Well, the numbers of the week. Is there any chance that would change because they're, they're in such sort of dire straits right now, and it's like. They need more help than they can give help, it seems like, so maybe that can, like, you know, the numbers could be, like... Absolutely. The, the number of the week in the finale was the machine itself, and you almost imagine the premiere is the same. Uh, with, the, with the addition of the fact that almost every one of our guys' numbers is up, because they're just being hunted. And, it, and it, I think, you know, the real challenge for us going forward is how in the world do these guys survive in this world? How do they get back? How do they get the machine up and running again? All these questions. And then, you know, Fusco is smack in the middle of... You know, an assassination of two kingpins that he arrested. There's gonna be a lot of questions for him, not only from the federal, uh, the FBI, but in internal affairs in terms of what actually went down that night. And I think that becomes a huge impetus for him to want to know more about what exactly is going on in this city right now. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, Elias, please tell me you didn't kill. Him. <laughs> you know. <laughs> have to wait two minutes. So <laughs> wait until one. Pretty whenever. dead to me. <laughs> there's so many. There's so many sci-fi shows out there. Uh, I mean, is that daunting for you guys? Like, yeah, yeah. the competition? Do you, do you watch a lot? Of <laughs> you know what? There's a couple of interesting things in there. I think Mr. Robot looks like an interesting show. I want to keep up, see how that goes. If we can hang. Um, I think the more difficult thing for us is having a science fiction element and broadcast. It's a little tougher than we imagined, but, um, you know, the thing, uh, Kevin just mentioned this at the other table, and I think it's true, is like, there is a certain amount of prejudice against broadcast shows in that regard, where people assume that there's not going to be a larger serialized narrative, there's not going to be a larger, like, where's this show going? And, and, and coupled with the fact that, you know, like, there's a number of procedurals on, on our network, I think we've kind of got lumped in to a degree with that tag, and I don't people realize that the, 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 people, the fans who would want to find this show may not know that it's on there, and then some of the people who would expect it to be in a, a CBS procedural are like, what is this? I can't follow it, you know, because they've missed 90 episodes. And so I, I think that's always been a bit of a, a marketing issue we, we, we'd like to, you know, to be able to pull in a new audience. I think we have an opportunity this fall because we're, we're going to be syndicated on WGN as well as, as Netflix a streaming option. We don't have a new date yet. Maybe, maybe they push it back enough that give some people a chance to catch up to the show who haven't seen it. And then by the time we air, it would be wonderful if our, if our partners at CBS gave us a straight run through, you know, when we didn't have any interruptions. I think all those things could really actually help our show.
Yeah, because they call it the golden age of television right now, but at the same time, it must be that much part of all the networks to try to capture uh, attention because there's so much out there. Everything's so and, and I have a theory that when people pay for a channel, it's subscription based, they're more attentive. And there's also a veneer of money's worth. There's a there's a bit of a pass there sometimes that, that this shows get, and and I don't think you get that as much in broadcast. I think now, particularly with younger people. Like my son in particular, it's like they're not going to watch anything unless their friends say, "Hey, do I need to be watching this?" And they're like, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll wait till you know. And, and I think some people. What's interesting now is I'm starting to run into some of these friends who missed like the first two, three seasons who are watching the show now because they're old enough and they realize, wait a minute, this is kind of cool. And, uh, and I knew we had it when he, when he asked me, and he's like, "What's going to happen next week?" <laughs> Didn't hear that for the first two seasons. <laughs> Kind of cool. How's it like being here at Comic Con? Uh, I think it's wonderful. I, mean, I was, I took the train down from LA, you know, sure. and uh, it's right there on the coast. It's just beautiful, and I'm sitting there like, it's amazing that like you can make television, take this train, Southern California, come down here to to like you know waves of, of adoring fans, and uh, we. I don't think the show ever feels more at home than when, than when we're here. I really do. Sure. Like we, our most uh, ardent fans always come out, and it makes you feel good. I think it makes, it makes all our actors feel really good about the show. Visibility here is key. Yeah, I'm just I'm bummed out. I missed the, the Star Wars thing. <laughs> <laughs> I did too, man. You know. uh, yeah. <laughs> JJ, hook me up. You tried to like make it. You, you kept saying that uh, you know. Um, you know, keeps clicking when it comes to current events. Um, you try to get, get like a rip from the headlines kind of feel to it. I think we were ahead of the headlines. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> ripped from us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wrote Law and Order. Well, that, that show ripped from the headlines. Um, no, I, I see what you're saying. And, uh, I don't know if we've been lucky or prescient, but I, I think it's really interesting what's going on now. You know, it was initially a show about to a degree of commentary on the surveillance state. Snowed Revelations came out, and everyone went, wait a second. Start talking more about artificial intelligence now. It's like Hawking and Elon are talking about this. You've got billionaires debating it now. And then the thing with the market happened last week, and you're like, wait a second, what's going on? I, I just think like we're all, we all now haven't really taken note of how insidious algorithms have become in our lives, that a lot of these things are inevitable. Increasing talks of roboticism and outsourcing and all these types of things. They're kind of baked into the concept of the show and, and law, law enforcement surveillance and you know, all those things are coming coming to fruition and it just sort of seems logical. Like, we're there. You don't have like a giant crystal ball in your yeah, I just hope it's not the dystopian we all think. The dystopian view. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? So, when, when you first started the show, did you initially conceive that the, that the machine would evolve to almost like a person? Uh, uh, where he's going, Father, I've failed you. Uh, right. You know, that sort of. Uh, it, or is that just. That was one of the happy accidents as you were planning. I think this is something we were really careful about in terms of anthropomorphizing the machine because, you know, there is a science fiction element to the show, but we've always wanted to be grounded. And we felt, you know, one of the reasons we, we hadn't given it much of a voice at that point in time is that we wanted. We wanted, I, I think yeah. the distance allows some, some credibility with people where it doesn't feel quite so intrusive. But if you've been with the show long enough, it was almost like you were longing for it. You wanted it. And in this moment, particularly if it were dying, and, and it, it was so startling watching Michael Emerson and, and the way he, he, he played that scene with the screen and what uh -huh. he was able to do was, was amazing. Yeah. And, and, I think Harold Finch in that moment was confronted with, oh, what would this be like, a world without my, my creation, my son, or whatever, yeah. you know? And I think in, in that moment, Harold Finch had a shift in his own view towards it. And I think that's what we want to we want to go further with this season. Uh, and I, it's always been a debate between Root and Harold. And so for her, she was always an acolyte of the machine. She wanted more, she wanted it open, she wanted it out there. And Harold was always you know, crippled it initially. Uh, he didn't trust you know, he made it a black box, and I think it's going to have to emerge if they have any prayer against this other ASI 
because things are going to have to change. Will they have to work together to rebuild the machine now and try to put some of their differences aside? Uh, I think their differences for what's going to really come out of the woodwork of rebuilding it. Uh, and I think you're going to see a little bit of a different health feature purchase here. And uh, it was also really great that you had that Pink Floyd song. Yeah. <laughs> what the, the we, we got, you know, when Joe and I initially talked about that song, we imagined that was the last song we played at the end of the show. Right. And then we got to this uh, that episode, and we were just like, we have to use it here. We have to. And it was tough. We couldn't get clearance initially, but we just kept coming at Pink Floyd over and over. Because those guys don't talk or whatever. It's kind of tough. Yeah. And, uh, and finally we got it at, at, at a price we could afford, and we were so excited. It, 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 as we always say, it has to pass the chill test. Like, you cannot use a song on our show unless you get goosebumps. If you don't get goosebumps, you can't use it. That's the rule. And I think your show is the best at doing that. Thank you. All right, good. Well, you guys are good. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Yeah.